God bless America and may uh, revival come to our land that we might be more blessable. We, uh, we live in this country and uh, if you watch the news for any length of time, you recognize there's a lot of bad news. Everything, see, and I know news, partly uh, good news doesn't sell very well. Bad news sells and so that's why we get a lot of bad news. We live in this world where it seems like everyone on television is screaming at each other and then uh, you add to that social media and everybody on social media is screaming at each other, complaints, and angry. And I, I came across this some years ago when they began doing it and I'll, I'll always tune in to catch one of these. Uh, Jimmy Fallon picked up on, there's a lot of bad news. And so what if instead of here's the good news and bad news, what if it was good news and good news? And he got some news anchors from around the country to report some imaginary stories of what if all the news was good news all the time. I'll give you a little sampling of it. Sometimes it'd be nice to have this. Oh, if it were only so, huh? All right. Uh, I certainly see the problems in our world, like uh, you see the problems in our world. The world is broken, stained by sin. and it, uh, Sometimes we, uh, we create... Uh, some consequences to our sin it brings brokenness and sometimes brokenness falls on us because of the world we live in there are blessings and joys and good gifts that God has bestowed on us though in this land in this world and that's where we're going to lean today as we look we're those of you who are with us first time maybe first time in a while we are singing our way through the psalms this summer and the psalms are filled with thanks to the Lord so many of them and in ways that we tend to not thank God, not incline our hearts. And so today we're going to do a little thanking of the Lord. And it's tough because we really do live in a world where we're more inclined toward anger, criticism, disapproval, disbelief, despair than thankfulness. So Thanksgiving in July, the psalmist in Psalm 92 said, It is good to give thanks to the Lord. The apostle Paul wrote, Give thanks in everything, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. God's will. What's God's will for my life? That you give thanks to the Lord. So often, think, think about your prayer time. I, I mean, this is coming out of my, my personal working, working my way through this chapter, the 100th Psalm that we're going to read in a moment. I think about my prayer time and I think, okay, in the flow of my time with God in prayer, how much of my, my time is spent saying, thank you, God. Thank you, God. For like my, my little quick list that I put together for the children's sermon. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. How much time? How what percentage of my time? I think about the story of the, the men, uh, 10 of them. Jesus, help us. We have, they have leprosy. They're going to die. Their terrible, loathsome disease separates them from everyone they love. It's, it's a horrible curse. No help, no hope. Jesus, would you help us? And, and Jesus miraculously heals them. Remember what happens? Nine of them just take off skipping down the street going, this is great. Wow, this is, we can go back to home. Everything is wonderful again. Only one of the ten, the Bible says, came back to Jesus to say thank you. Probably for most of us, if you, if you gauged your time in prayer with the Lord, if 10% of your prayer time was spent with, uh, uh, it was spent with thanking God for things, it would probably be miraculous for most all of us. Why should we be a thankful people? What would that look like? And the 100th Psalm uh, is helpful in these things. As a pastor years ago, and a couple of generations ago, who said, the beginning of man's rebellion against God was and is the lack of a thankful heart. How about that? I think he may be just about right. Adam and Eve, in a perfect environment, all their needs provided, in a perfect relationship to God, but it wasn't enough. And here comes sin into the world. Uh, in a perfect environment. The lack of a thankful heart drives us into a lot of things that are sin and destructive. Uh, in uh, that famous poem, and it's uh, 
used in a lot of different contexts, but I'm going to use it maybe in a different way today. The poem uh, by uh, W.E. Henley, Invictus. And Invictus means unconquered in Latin. And it's a testimony to the unconquered human spirit. And sometimes it's a cheerleader quote, but the imagery of the whole poem is someone standing before the gates of hell and they're convinced they can take it on all by themselves. Nothing can stop them. Nothing can hold them back. That the, the person speaking is fully su sufficient within themselves to accomplish all that needs to be accomplished. You know the last stanza. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. And that sums up how a whole lot of folks uh, seem to go through life. It's an attitude that we see ourselves. I am the source of my strength, the source of my hope, the source of my happiness, the source of all that is success in me. And even with a Christian biblical worldview, you can just get sucked into that world so quickly and so easily. There's an ever-present danger of thinking, all that I am, all that I have, all that I have achieved is a result of my discipline, my hard work, my effort, my strong, strong will. And it's so contrary to the spirit-filled life described in the Bible for the followers of Jesus Christ. Those of us who know Jesus, who have been born again, who have been given that gift of eternal life, should not give in to such an attitude. And the 100th Psalm tells us some great reasons why. Big, sweeping reasons. I don't always do this. But I'm going to ask you to stand up as we read the 100th Psalm. And because I am grace-filled, there are only five verses. So, here we go. This is Psalm 100, and the little subtitle under it in my translation, A Psalm of Thanksgiving. Let the whole earth shout triumphantly to God. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before Him with joyful songs. Acknowledge that the Lord is God. He made us and we are His, His people, the sheep of His pasture. Enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him and bless His name. For the Lord is good, and His faithful love endures forever. His faithfulness through all generations. We're going to take that apart one piece at a time, and we're going to see a whole lot of reasons to be thankful to God. God bless the reading of His Word. You may be seated. By the way, in that word of thankfulness, um, I'm, thank I'm thankful for Jeff Mize today. Because you know what? There was a line in every one of those songs somewhere that came right out of the 100th Psalm today. And uh, I appreciate how he prepares that you may not notice it, but as I'm preaching through this sermon, I hear that's why he chose that song. Because it speaks to point number two, point number three, point number four, right on down through that outline. And uh, prepares the way. So you've already gotten most of this sermon. If you sang it, if you didn't, well... We'll pray for your hard heart. Now, here's some reasons to be thankful. Here's the first, first of all, let's just start out with who God is. Not what God has done for us. We'll get to that. But, and often that's where we start. But how about just who God is? So this is theology, the doctrine of God. And here's what we get. Verse 3, <laughs> and you have an outline there. You can fill some God is God. Now, how about that? It sounds a little bit redundant to say God is God, but the Lord, He is God. God is God, and it's worth noting. Even people who believe in God still mostly believe in themselves. And, and they, start to, they start to rely on me and mine and what I can do and what I have done and their, our own ability or trusting in our luck. And uh, it's important to remember... There is one God, and He is God. The bottom line on this first thing is very simple. He is God, and we are not. And you go, oh, well, yeah, of course, of course we're not God. However, the most commonly named sin in the Bible is idolatry. And the most common uh, source of that 
idol worship is ourselves. Over and over again, putting your faith, your dependence on yourself instead of on the God of heaven for how life goes and what life looks like and how you choose and how you decide and what you do and what you don't do. God is God and we are not. And I'm telling you, you ought to give thanks because that's a good plan. Second thing is that God is good. Verse 5 declares, the Lord is good. Now, when we read the Bible, a lot of you, if you were going to say God is, you'd say God is love, and that shows up uh, a lot. And we'll talk about that in just a while. God is love. But as often as it says God is love, it's going to tell you God is good. God is good, and he, he not only does good things for us, but He is good in His character. He is, he is good. He is the author of all good things. In Genesis 1, in the creation story, God saw all that He had made, and it was very good indeed. I like how the CSB reads that. Paul related to Romans this word. We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to His purpose. And why is that? Because it all came from a good, the hand of a good, good God. James declared, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights who does not change like shifting shadows. Every good and perfect gift, it's from Him. Have you thanked God today for His goodness to you? And that's one of those things that just doesn't show up very often, I think, in our prayer time, for your goodness. I came across this story a while back. It's uh, from India. There's a harvest festival taking place, and there was a, a small group of Christians that were in this particular part of India, very much a minority group where they were, and they didn't have a pastor but there was a pastor that he would travel along and every so often he'd be in their area and they'd walk in for miles to be a part of a gathering of believers. Believers scattered out so far from one another and a lot of persecution in the area. And, and so the, pa the traveling pastors coming through, they gather up in their little, their little group and there was a, a, a widow and she was known to be very poor and she came to the gathering with well, they considered an extravagant offering of uh, grain that she had brought for this particular sacrifice, rice. And it was far more than like this woman would, we, we, they would say, would be able to afford. And the pastor, he didn't know much about her. And again, he didn't have a great, uh, deep relationship with any of these folks, but he knew this much, that the widow was very poor. And he asked her, are you making the offering in gratitude for some unusual blessing? And she said, yes. And this is what she related. My son was sick and I promised a large gift to God if he got well. The pastor said, so he's recovered? And she said, no. He died last week. But I know that he is in God's care. And for that, I am especially, especially thankful. There are things I don't understand in this. So, uh, say, yeah, this time yesterday I was standing in this same spot. And this building was packed out for a funeral for a teenager who died way too soon and tragically. And I told them, there's just a whole lot I don't understand about why things happen the way they do and uh, why tragedy touches us. I can give you a theological explanation. It won't make you feel much better. But I'm convinced from God's Word, and I'm convinced from walking with the Lord through a variety of circumstances and experiences in my own walk with Him, that of all things about God, God is good. He is good. God is everlasting. The psalmist, and again, still in verse 5, there's so much of this come from verse 5. His love endures forever. Forever. And we'll get to the love part, but we're going to do the forever part first. Our God has no beginning or no ending. 
One of those, uh, my favorite little theological ways of describing God, uh, there was never a time when God was not. There, he has no beginning. He has no end. There was never a time when God was not. He has always been. He is the eternal one. At the end of the story, he is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He's the one who is. He's the one who was. He's the one who will forever be. He is the eternal one. And, okay, so yeah. Oh, yeah, sure. That, that's an easy one for us. We go, oh, yeah, I've heard that before. Yeah, no, God's, not, God's, God's forever. Why is that a big deal? My, my favorite application of that personally is this. I've purchased some things in my lifetime that I was displeased with. I know that's never happened to you. You're a better shopper than me. But I have bought things through the course of my life that I think I am terribly disappointed in this and I'm taking it back. And come to find out the manufacturer no longer is in business. There's nobody to take it back to. The store has closed and there's nobody to carry through on the guarantee on the product. And I am terribly disappointed in that because things come and go out there in the world. But I found this, you can count on God to be around to back up his promises. Because he's not going anywhere. I thank God. He is everlasting. He is love. God is love. Verse 5. His love is everlasting. It endures. It lasts. The, this is the Old Testament word for love. And it is, it is used throughout to refer to how God relates to his covenant people. How does God relate to his covenant people? With this, this word that's translated here, love. His love is everlasting. It endures. He is the God of relationship. He's not just God far off in heaven. He didn't just get the world spinning and then walk off and leave it. He is close to us, not far off. He is God with us. He's involved with my life. He is involved with your life. He is interested in what you're doing. He's interested in what's happening in your life. God cares about you and he cares about me. The Apostle Peter, he's writing late in his life. He said, this, I'm casting all my cares on him. And you ought to cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. He does. John, the Apostle, you remember John in the Gospels, he doesn't, he's not listed like, and then John did this, doesn't write about himself in the third person. He'll say, and then the disciple whom Jesus loved said, what a great way to identify yourself in relationship to God. The one that, Je I'm, just, I'm just a guy, but I'm the guy Jesus loved. And he wrote a lot about love. And it was late in his life, really toward the end of the story, that he records this in 1 John. This is how we know that we remain in him and he in us. He has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and we testify that the Father has sent his Son as the world's Savior. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God remains in him and he is in God. And we've come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And the one who remains in love remains in God and God remains in him. In this is love. In this love is made complete with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also we are in this world. There's no fear in love. Instead, Perfect love drives out fear because fear involves punishment. So the one who fears does not complete, is not complete in love. We love because he first loved us. Number five, uh, I started out with one wording and I had to change it. I, I had uh, God is faithful, but that's not, that's not right. God is forever faithful. He is not just faithful, he is forever faithful. In those closing uh, words in verse 5, his faithfulness continues through all generations. Uh, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's not going anywhere. Forever faithful. Always there. Here's the thing the Bible tells us. We may be unfaithful to him. We're going to come up short of the glory of God. But he will never be unfaithful to us. Generation to generation, he is God and there is no other. The psalmist said, your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Your rule for all generations. The Lord is faithful in all his words, gracious in all his actions. 
he can just be counted on. And I can count on him for what I'm wrestling with today, and I can count on him for eternal things because of who God is. But then there's some more specific things, not just who God is, but what he has done. And uh, again, it's, it's not as simple as the little list I read earlier, bigger, more sweeping, but God has made us. How about that? He is the creator. Verse 3, it is he who made us. He is a master designer. In uh, the Psalms uh, 139, the Bible tells it this way, as he's created us. For it, is, it was you who created my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I will praise you because I have been remarkably and wonderfully made. Your works are wondrous, and I know this very well. My bones are not hidden from you when I was made in secret, when I was formed in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw me when I was formless. All my days were written in your book and planned before a single one of them began. How, how involved is God in you? In all the details. But as amazing as that miracle of, and I remember my children being born and that miracle of, of birth, as amazing as that miracle is, how much more amazing is spiritual birth? I'm so grateful I got to be present when my children were born. Oh, but the experiences I've had in the course of my life to, to, see, to see my children come to Christ and be there when they gave their lives to Christ, to see uh, so many others who experienced the second birth. Spiritual birth is a great blessing. I, I enjoy the Living Bible is a, more of a commentary than a translation for sure, but John 17, the high priestly prayer, I appreciate this wording. Jesus is praying to the Lord, he's praying for his disciples, and he said, I and them, you and me, and all being perfected into one, so that the world will know you sent me and will understand that you love them as much as you love me. Okay, now that last part, uh, that, that, that's wild. God, Jesus says, Jesus the Son says to God the Father, praying for his disciples, that his love for us is as great as his love for Jesus himself. Now that's a whole lot of love going on. That, that's something to, to meditate. We talk about meditation. Just sit and soak on that one for a while. What, the, the depth of the love of God for us. The miracle of our spiritual birth. God loved you and me uh, as he loved his own son. And that's a lot of love. That's, that's the kind of... Charles Wesley was writing about uh, processing God's love for him. And uh, There's a song we've sung uh, a lot of times around here that's drawn from this, what, what Wesley wrote, uh, reflecting on his own salvation, his own relationship to, to Christ. And he said, amazing love, how can it be that you, my God, would die for me? God is our, God has made us and God is our ruler. We are his people. See, Jesus, ruler, he is the king, he's the master, he's the Lord, he's He's overall. And we don't like to be ruled over. We, we're pretty independent folk. Uh, as a culture in this country, we, we just don't like other people telling us what to do. Or, or, and, and, it, and it bleeds over into how we look at relationship to God and our relationship to God. We really resist this part of it. We've had thousands now of gospel conversations and it's in our community, in our outreach efforts, we're, I must say, blown on past the 20,000 door knock mark now in our community outreach. And, and how many times we've, we've had a conversation with folks who say, oh yeah, I believe in Jesus. I believe Jesus died on the cross to pay for my sin. Oh yeah, I believe he was raised from the dead. Awesome! You took the faith step. Now will you surrender your life to him? Savior and Lord. And that's where we get hung up over and over again in our city. 
Because people say, oh, I, I, I believe that because that doesn't, I don't have to do anything about that. But him to be the Lord of my life, I, I got to change something. I'm going to have to adjust my life. I'm going to have to actually hand him the keys. Uh, and I don't want to do that because I want to maintain control. I would just tell you, he is a gracious ruler. He is a wise, wise king. And he will guide you in the best and the brightest and the clearest always. Paul wrote about a day that would come when all would finally see Jesus as Lord. When they'll get to that, he's the king, he's the ruler, he's the master, he's in charge. And uh, so a lot of people, they know the story of Jesus, but they are not going to go to heaven when they die because they have not said and I will follow him. And he will direct my paths. And, 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 and stopping short of a relationship to God. A lot of folks are going to fill churches all over DFW today. And that's where they missed it. That's where they, they just so close. And yet so far from a relationship to God. One day everybody's going to get there. But this life is the opportunity to make that commitment so that you can spend eternity in heaven with God. But in eternity, everybody's going to get there. Everybody's going to, not to heaven. Everybody's going to get to the spot where they say, Jesus is Lord. But some of them are going to realize it, but their eternity is going to be in hell forever, separated from God. Everybody gets there. Paul wrote to the Philippians, for this reason, God highly exalted him, speaking of Christ, gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Why not today? Why not today? He's a good ruler. God is our provider. Oh, that's for sure. Here, that image uh, in verse 3. The sheep of his pasture. Like uh, David wrote in the 23rd Psalm, the Lord is a good, good shepherd. He takes care of his sheep. He provides for the sheep. Paul wrote to the Philippians again, I, My God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. All your needs provided. We think about provision of God and uh, we always think there ought, ought to be more, I think. Well, uh, what, but it's great what I have, but God, if you could just bump the door open a little more and give me this much more, add on to the stack this much more, then I'd be really happy and I'd be really grateful. And when difficulty comes into our lives, we just don't know how to process that. You know, we experience loss. We all do. We experience illness. We, we're all going to, if you live long enough, it's going to come around uh, uh, there are a lot of things that we, we encounter. and God provides what we need for the day. Uh, I, hadn't, I told this story. I think it, my record says I think it was 12, 15 years ago, something like that. Uh, so I figure you've all slept since then. You wouldn't remember if I said it last week probably. But, uh, so I'm coming back to a story because I saw it again this week in a blog article I was reading. It's uh, about Corey Ten Boom. Some of you know uh, the book, The Hiding Place, the story, The Hiding Place. And how uh, Corey Ten Boom, her sister Betsy, they're, they're, uh, they're, hiding, they're hiding folks from the Nazis in any way. In the course of all this, she and her sister, as middle-aged women, end up in a series of prison camps and uh, pretty ugly and uh, Betsy's going to die in one of those Betsy's the oldest uh, child if I recall correctly and, and so they, they were transferred from camp to camp it's concentration camps and the worst that they'd seen up to that point in Ravensbrook and it was just a horrible place they went into the barracks where they were going to be housed it was crazy overcrowded and ridiculously infested with fleas and it was just Misery from the moment they went into that barracks, and uh, now Betsy, she really she really brings Corey along uh, and, and guides her through the process, and so such a 
wonderful godly pair of sisters and uh the, the day, I don't know if God's ever done this to you before where you, you do your Bible reading and then everything that happens that day relates directly to what you read in the Bible that day and you go, well, I'm actually going to have to do this. I don't want to. Well, sometimes it does work that way. Well, their Bible reading that day was from 1 Thessalonians. In that last part of 1 Thessalonians, it says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in everything the day they moved into this place. So Betsy says, well, the first thing we need to do today is to thank God for everything about our new uh, home here at Ravensbrook. We need to thank him for everything. Okay, so Corey says she went along with him for a while until they got to the fleas. At this point, they, you know, the bites all over both of them. They'd only been there for a few hours. And, and uh, she said, no, we need to thank God for the fleas. Which, I mean, some of us go, oh, really? You know, I think she's a nut, but thank God for the fleas. Well, Corey had had none of it, but finally, Betsy wore down. We're praying for the, thank God for the fleas. So they, first day in the barracks, they thank God for the fleas. And the story goes on that they were just really amazed that, and they, they had a Bible with them. They had managed to keep a Bible with them through this journey. And at this point, still have a copy of God's Word. And so they're amazed. They have this incredible freedom to study the Bible. They start gathering up other people. I mean, these people are such a, in this dark place, they are such a light that everybody's drawn to them. And uh, they're studying the Bible. And they're having little prayer meetings. And, and nobody's bothering them. The guards want to not give them any difficulties at all. And they're just amazed. This goes on for a good while. And it was months later that they finally found out why. <laughs> One of the guards said, there's no way we're going to that barracks. It's covered up in fleas. Wow. Give thanks in all things. God provides. Even we don't realize what he's doing or how he's doing it, he provides. And then God has saved us. Verse 4, we enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise the Bible records God saying when you come to worship me who asks you to parade through my courts with all your ceremony God says these are my courts this is my house and it belongs to me and God controls access to the courts his courts and he controls access who's coming through those gates the Bible says nothing unclean will ever enter it nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who those written in the Lamb's book of life. Who comes into God's house? Who comes into his eternity in heaven? God makes a way, and he invites us to come. When the psalmist tells us to enter God's courts and gates, there's only one way you're walking through those stepping in those courts and walking through those gates. And it's through a relationship to Jesus Christ. Giving your life to him who gave his life for you at the cross. And there is no other way. Salvation is found in no one else. There's no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. There is one way to be saved. It's through Jesus. And I don't want you to miss, miss heaven. Trying to find your own way. He's made a way. He has created the path of salvation. I think about my life and reflection. I have so much for which to be thankful. Reminded uh, the 16th century reformer Martin Luther said, We cannot give God anything. I mean, everything is already His. All we have comes from Him. We can only offer praise, and thanks, and honor. And I look back and think, how many times, just in the last year, in my own life, how many times in the last year have I caught myself grumbling to God? I want this different about me, about my family, about my work, about, my, about uh, this, about that. How many times, uh, how often, with all of God's goodness, <laughs> I, I found myself in my read through the Bible process, 
You get to get in there and during the Exodus wanderings with Moses, how uh, the people complained about the diet. Always gets me. They said, this is wrong, and this is wrong, and this is wrong. They complained to God about all this stuff. And we're sick of eating this manna every day. Can't you give us something besides manna? Oh, the supernatural, miraculous food that comes down from heaven that you eat, every, the miracle every day is what you'd like changed? Oh, how many miracles. How many amazing things of God. How many, how many gifts God offers up. And uh, I am unthankful. Uh, and I just want to get better at that. And so, I've spent a good deal of time thinking about the 100th Psalm and praying about the 100th Psalm and uh, changing up some things in how I relate to God and my world from the 100th Psalm. And Happy Thanksgiving in July. My prayer for me and you is that we would, we would be a thankful people. There's certain things about being a Christian in our culture, in our world, that just, okay, that's so crazy that only God's people do that. It makes God's people stand out from the crowd quickly. And one of the things that does that more than anything, I think, is an overwhelming sense of thankfulness. Because we live in a thankless world where people just don't, they don't care about anything. They're not grateful for anything. They're expecting. It's, it's all about complaining and criticizing and attacking. But a really, really thankful people will shine in a dark world. Let's be a thankful people.